Hello there, I'm David Wolf. I'm the Director of the Community Univers University Partnership Programme, or CUP, at the University of Brighton. And I'm Juliet Millican, Deputy Director at CUP. Just to say a, a quick word about the image that um, uh, you can see on the, on the PowerPoint. It's an image that's um, from a, a painting that's uh, really important to us. Uh, it really signifies uh, some of the, the, the key things about the work that we try and do. It's called the Pink Pavilion, which is a, an iconic, important building in Brighton, which you may, may be aware of, the Brighton Pavilion. Um, and it's a, it's a substantial, large piece of, piece of art that was co-created by um, one of our uh, master's students who studies inclusive arts and four artists with learning disabilities. They worked on it together um, as part of a long-standing programme called Access to Art, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, and this was a, a, a key piece of work that was in a uh, prestigious exhibi exhibition in the city, and we felt we wanted it so much that we purchased it and now hangs proudly in our offices. Just to tell you a little bit about our team and our aims, um, We've got three aims, uh, um, and these are pre pretty much the aims that we've had from the beginning of CUP, which started in 2003. Um, the first aim is about how people can access the university. Um, university, as, as you may well be well aware, is a complicated, large entity. And often it's very confusing and difficult for people outside or even inside the organisation to make sense of how you navigate it. So our first aim is about how to make it easy and straightforward for local communities to come to the University of Brighton and say, say what they think they need and get it. So that's the first aim. The second aim is about enhancing the, 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 the ability of the, of the community or community organisation and the university to co-work. These things don't come immediately or without attention. They take a lot of work, so this is our second aim, and we say that we, we try and establish partnerships that are for mutual benefit, for the benefit of the university and for the benefit of the community. And our third and final aim is, is relates to the fact that, that community university co-working is such an enormous range of possibilities. Um, is it about um, members of the public accessing information about the latest scientific research? Is it about um, uh, wealthy communities accessing art and museums um, that, and collections that universities hold? I mean, both of those are, are people are legitimate um, endeavours, of course. But we felt that it was important, to, given that we have a small resource, to prioritise the work we do that, that addresses um, social inequalities within our local communities. So we do do other things, but where we have a choice, we look to prioritise um, disadvantaged, marginalised communities, communities who are particularly excluded from, from society. And we organise ourselves through four, four areas. Um, a help desk, community knowledge exchange, student community engagement and research and development. And just to run th through those very briefly, we'll come back to them all. Help desk is an absolutely critical thing for us. It's the way into the, way into the university for communities. Very much about our first aim. A community knowledge exchange is about um, trying to enable um, a community partners and university researchers and, 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 and teachers to connect together over significant pieces of work. I'll talk more about that too in a minute. Student community engagement is, is where we develop the curriculum to enable students to have um, experience of working within communities to contribute but to develop themselves through doing that. And what we mean by research and development is where we think about the whole area of communities and universities working together and how that can work well, thinking about our, our practices and our processes and, and communicating those and sharing those and learning from other people. 
So just going back to the history of, of, of how we got started, um, began as an externally funded project in 2003 with support from a, an American phil philanthropic trust. Quite an unusual start, really. Um, an organisation called Atlantic Philanthropies heard our, our, vice, our then Vice Chancellor, um, uh, the late Professor Sir David Watson, um, talk on, on a Radio 4 programme about the role of universities in communities. And they were so impressed with what they heard, they contacted him, and CUP as a project came out of that. And I think it's a significant thing to note, because it, it, it wasn't, we weren't set up through mainstream education funds. Um, and I think that shows the kind of um, adventure and um, innovation that may be required here, certainly in the UK then, and perhaps still, that this kind of work, working with communities, isn't part of the mainstream. We're encouraged to define in the doing and experiment with what works, because certainly when we started, and to a degree still I think it's the case, that we weren't sure what constituted what was within the, the, the world of community university partnerships. We thought it was, it was an idea that looked good, had lots of possibilities, but we didn't want to spend a large amount of time on definitional work before we'd started, and we were encouraged to take an on an action-oriented approach to, define, to defining the work. So we'll do lots of pilots, do lots of small work, and see whether those were the kind of things people thought were worthwhile. So it's really important, and we still do a lot of that work. We still do seed projects. We still do little things that, that enable us to, to test things out. In, in the early days, there were a lot of expectations that, 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 that um, people had of the, the Community University Partnership Programme. Uh, local community partners often thought that they were, they were able to knock on the door and say, can I have lots of money to do the project that I'm doing? And it was quite hard for them to understand in the beginning that what we were talking about here well, wasn't really traditional funding, even though we had some funds. This was more about um, resourcing partnership, resourcing working together, um, rather than delivering services in a normal charitable way. We did some early projects at the beginning. Um, the first couple would included access to art project, which I've mentioned already. Refugees into higher education was another one of ours. We did a third one around um, a, a, the role of um, sports training for young disadvantaged people. And we used those early projects to help us define what we would do in the, in the future. The help desk has been absolutely critical. It took us a, a while to get started on it, but once we, once we did, we realised that actually this was the cornerstone of our work, that actually we have an open point that enables um, community partners, community organisations, communities to, to contact us with the vaguest of ideas, not n quite knowing what the university can offer, and help them both scope out what they do and connect with the right person or people in the university. Um, we're running at around about 350 inquiries a year currently, which we'll talk about a bit later, but a large volume of in inquiries. And it, it, it enables the, the whole programme to be kept on track, that it becomes led and driven by community need and requirement in the first instance through the help desk. Absolutely fundamental concept for us. We added in student community engagement. We went for a study tour to America and heard about what they call service learning and bought that that... that we saw the potential as being enormous there, and we hadn't really contemplated that at the beginning of the program. And then we, we also developed seed funding um, as, as, as we went through, although from the beginning, we've, as, as we were talking about, we've, we have funded projects. The early pilots were, were part of that. When the project period and the project funds came to an end in 2006, CUP was taken into being a core part of the University of Brighton. We had strong support of senior management and our commitment to community and social engagement was written into the strategic plan. We're very aware that um, as a unit uh, within the University of Brighton, we're lucky and that many other similar projects do not have the same senior management support. Um, but we were provided with core funding uh, for a team of five, director, administrator, and development managers in all those areas of our work, the help desk, student community engagement, and the seed fund. So we could work from there in order to develop activity across the university in ways that other universities haven't been able to do, where there have been pockets of activities uh, 
in particular areas or, or disciplines of the university. Um, in 2012, with the second strategic plan, the university adopted one of our key themes that of learning to make a difference, which we've adopted for some of our publications. Um, and this became a core theme within the 2012 strategic plan, with the university making a commitment that all undergraduates would have the opportunity for engaged learning as part of their degree programme. That is accredited learning, which is different from volunteering and which students do as a core part of their university undergraduate study. When the Cup became a core part of the university, we obviously needed to be located somewhere as a project. Uh, the project has existed within strategic planning, but with a mandate to work across the university in different faculties and schools, um, we couldn't be really located in one single academic school or academic faculty. The courses that we offer were validated by specific uh, departments, but as a, as a whole team, um, we were brought together in a department that was created specifically to combine economic and social engagement from 2007. Within the field of community university partnerships, we're aware that there are debates around the advantages and disadvantages of combining with economic engagement. Some countries swear by it and say all external engagement should be brought together. Um, in other places, we're very aware of the differences. And for us at Brighton too, um, the feeling was different on our different campuses. And one of our outlying campuses in a small town an hour away from Brighton, we developed something called the, the Hastings Exchange, which specifically combined economic and social engagement. Um, but economic engagement in that town uh, was more seen in terms of poverty alleviation rather than wealth creation. In Brighton, within the Department for Economic and Social Engagement, we're aware that there are differing cultures um, between the, the work that CUP does, dedicated to community engagement, to addressing issues of disadvantage and discrimination, um, and the work that is income generating for the University of Brighton. So there's no one single easy answer to where such a unit should be located. But at the moment, this is where we exist, and this is how we report. Um, and a current snapshot of our activities. So far since our inception, we've had over 2,000 inquiries from community organisations, over 5,000 students at undergraduate level involved in community projects as part of their study, 150 knowledge exchange partnerships, um, and a dozen active communities of practice. Communities of practice is a term we've adopted from uh, Etienne Wenger. Uh, to describe groups of people that come together from different backgrounds, different disciplines, different practices, but are united around a common issue or a common passion. Um, and it's a, a useful term for our mature projects that move beyond seed fund into long-term partnerships and long-term ways of working together in many di different iterations year on year. Um, and 13 years on, CUP now has a, a whole host of active communities of practice that continue to meet together almost without our support um, and act as strong partnerships in their own right. And we have ongoing strong links with a number of community organisations across the city. We're involved on trustee boards, on consultation and research audits across the city on the co-delivery of projects um, and the co-production of, of research. And some of our strongest partners are the APEX NGOs, the coordinating bodies for NGOs, um, and uh, local authorities um, and services. Over last year, this pie chart just represents some of our inquiries to show the range of inquiries that people are asking for when they contact our help desk. Uh, largest number of them, 147, asking for information and resources. The next number that, that shows us as uh, blue on the screen, asking for research support, for advice or guidance. Um, the next number, for the purple quota, asking for student support. Um, and the, the smaller group for finance or other types of inquiries. Some of our research now is directed towards student groups and we particularly work to broker partnerships between master students who take on a piece of research as part of their final thesis and um, research for community organisations for projects that they would not otherwise be able to fund. Another area of our work we call student community research, which involves brokering research projects um, 
and matching master's students who are looking for live research to do as part of their master's thesis study and community organisations who have projects that they would not otherwise be able to fund. This is based on a European model often referred to as science shops where students take on research projects for part, um, on behalf of community organisations. Um, and we've learned in doing that that it's not as straightforward as it might seem. It entails quite a lot of brokering and a deeper investigation of what each group mean by research, the, the requirements of the community organisation, the requirements of the university that's asking for an academic product for its students, um, and the, the need to manage the expectations of both sides so that we can create a realistic project that students can um, complete within the time available for their master's study, uh, but that has a real value for the organisation that they're doing it for. When brokered well, we find that um, both groups benefit considerably. The student from doing a life project for an organisation and the organisation from getting a piece of high quality research that's not only done by a, an enthusiastic student, but receives supervision from the student supervisor at university. In order to make these projects work, we try to ensure that we support the student um, by going with them to a first meeting with the organisation, by working through an agreement form that specifies the requirements of both groups, the timescale that they have available to do it in, um, and the ownership of the final product that comes out of the piece of work. So we have students from a whole host of different disciplines, from media, from education, from business, from social sciences, uh, who take on a final project. And that project product uh, could be a, a written research report, but it could be a completed video with a piece of analysis or a, a piece of research design or marketing design uh, that a student will do for an organisation. I just wanted to say something briefly about um, our views on um, research and societal impact um, because this has become latterly a, a very important area for us that we didn't quite anticipate in, early, in earlier times but I think it's really important in making the case for this kind of work. Um, people may well be aware of the, the UK has, has recently been through a major research, research access, assessment exercise called the Research Excellence Framework. Um, which is across all universities, a uh, huge exercise lasting a number of years, which essentially evaluates the university's research work and then allocates large amounts of funding to universities on the basis of how well they do. For the first time ever, this, this time of exercise included impact, societal impact of the research. And what we found was the University of Brighton performed very well on societal impact societal impact to such a degree it had a, it had a, a very beneficial effect on the overall assessment of the university's research. Looking into that in more depth we realised that a quarter of the impact case studies that we submitted were based on community and university partnership working. Um, another equal number in fact were based on business uh, university partnership working. So we, we were, able, were able to make the case of the, of the importance of external engagement work in supporting the university's uh, impact of the university's research work. I'd now like to talk about a few of our projects to make, to make this um, talk a little more concrete and more, and more real for people. Um, so I'm going to run, we're now run through a, a few of our projects. that have got different aspects to give you a kind of flavour of the different types of work that we do. I've already mentioned Access to Arc a couple of times and that's not surprising, it's been such an incredibly important project for us. Something we started right at the beginning of CUP, it still runs today. The problem to be resolved was the a local community organisation came to us and said that they work with talented artists who have learning disabilities um, such as um, autism or Asperger's syndrome or Down's syndrome, who are talented artists but are given no encouragement, no support, no professional development to, to, work, to work with their art skills. So we teamed them up with our School of Art, matched them with um, second year art students working as, not as volunteers, but as part of their course, to, do, to, to enable the, the, those student, University of Brighton student volunteers to act as learning ad advocates for the artists with learning disabilities. And we've now run, in, in through the School of Art, um, a, a, a large number of 
of, of these kind of courses where artists with learning disabilities come into the university, work with students, work with lecturers, and the, the results have been spectacular over the time. The, the artists have received funding in their own right from the Arts Council, they've got their own, art, their own art studio, they've um, sold their work commercially, like, the, like the, the work we showed you on the first slide, the Pink Pavilion. Um, they've done exhibitions ab abroad, they've um, uh, developed their work incredibly. But this, uh, the university students as well have also developed, developed themselves enormously through the work. Some of them have said to us things like, my drawing has been transformed because I've had to explain it to someone who's got very different communication requirements. So, so that's, that's in, incredibly important to an educationist there. The, 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 the learning benefits for our, for our university students are enormous too. It's also become a major area of, res, of research for the university. We also have a master's qualification in inclusive arts. So it's now become embedded in, in teaching and research at the university and it continues and thrives to this day. Different type of project. This is um, a, a project that came out of our Eastbourne campus, which is in, a, in an area where there's quite a lot of land on, on the campus to use. And um, two of our schools there, the Occupational um, Health Department and the um, Service Management, who do look at hospitality and restaurants and that kind of thing, came together to, to, with some community partners to create um, growth food growing space on the university um, for students and community groups to co-work together on. Um, and there's now quite a substantial area of community gardening on the campus that um, we, have, we have a relationship with older people's groups, with um, groups working with people with mental health problems. But the students from the university are using the, the co-work as part of their studies, as part of their occupational health, occupational therapy studies. Or, uh, or the hospitality students as, as part of the, the food growing and, and, and use process. So again, the, the, mut the mutual benefit is there. Dis dispensing with the mystery works in another discipline again, works with the pharmacy department. Um, the pharmacy lecturers were saying to us that their students were, were not getting enough connection with people. They, were, they had very good technical training, but they weren't... Um, meeting people and, and developing their communication skills enough. And then they were going into roles as community pharmacists without that kind of training and those skills in those areas. So we connected them up with an older people's group. Um, there's befriending, befriending relationships set up between the pharmacy students and the older people. And, the, and they, through that befriending relationship, the pharmacy students help the old, older people review their medication. There's a massive problem of older people mistaking medication, so it's a very useful thing in its own right. And then this, this, this both benefits the older people, benefits the university students. And again, this has been running for a decade, and the, the department now have um, administrative support dedicated to this project because they find it so useful. A, a different type of project, to, again, this is, um, uh, a, a, uh, and this is really a community of practice, we might call it. It's been running for the best part of a decade with our, with our local um, community and voluntary sector body in, in Brighton who are the, the network body who work with all the, the other groups and organisations in the city. And they wanted a, um, a, an economic and social audit of the impact of the community and voluntary sector in Brighton and Hove. And when, when we fir first started working with them, we, the first go, they, they did a straightforward commission to uh, a researcher, and we helped them a bit with organise that. They weren't terribly satisfied with that process, and so the second iteration, which was, which was, in, which was in 2008, called Taking Account, we uh, um, found the funds to get the time of a university professor and a research officer, and we co-worked with a group of community organisations to, to, to develop this this social and economic audit. It went very well. And the most recent iteration, which was just last year, the community organisation themselves took the lead and the university had an advisory and support role. So we feel that the capacity has been developed through this kind of community of practice type working. So it's very valuable. 
As, as you can tell, we, we've done an awful lot of pieces of work and projects, all, all these in, help desk inquiries turning into small pieces of work. Um, so we've done quite a lot of thinking um, and, and felt there's a lot of challenges around how you capture um, both the scale of the work, how much is going on, and what difference it's making and the impact of it. And we've tried a number of different, uh, different approaches which, quite frankly, they've all been a little bit difficult. We've, we've been down the route of auditing everything and sending out people lots of forms, and we've done that once, and people told, said to us, don't ever do that again, it was way too hard, and we were uh, putting people off getting involved in the work. So we've actually come up with um, using uh, some, some software that's been developed at the University of Brighton with a, uh, one of our main community partners, um, to um, do digital mapping of the work. So we're actually trying a different approach rather than kind of surveying and auditing um, or traditional research. We're trying to get the work um, displayed visually um, and in a, in a light enough way for people to get involved. So we're using this Community 21 digital mapping, which I'll just get up on the screen. So what, what you see here is a large number of um, different um, symbols with different letters on. And these all um, denote a community university partnership project. We haven't got all of them up there at the moment. We've, I think we've got something around 60, so there's plenty more still to put up. But we're, we're making good progress on it. And if you, just to give an example of what you, the kind of thing you can do here, I'll just click on one. So this gives us a... Um, a, a write-up, there's a film there, this is a project about the benefits for people with mental health problems of, uh, of nature and being in the countryside. So there's a little write-up there and then um, there's some, some documents, that sh so there's a little poster that won a competition at the university about, about the work. So we, we're trying to capture this kind of material uh, with um, all, all the pro projects that we're working with. And oddly enough, even the ones that we don't even, we don't, we're not directly working with. So, because that's one of the problems. With, look, look, it's great when people go off and do their own stuff that had nothing to do with us, but we may never know about it. So we're trying to encourage everybody in the university and local communities who are working together to submit their information so we can grapple with all, with all, with all of this, and th with this map, you can you can classify it in in terms of different types of work, artwork or health work, and then you can get you can get a, a, a segment of the both the geographical area and the type of work that you're interested in. At the heart of all cup projects, since its inception until now, is relationship building. If projects are going to work, if they're going to be properly mutually beneficial, if both groups are to learn from each other and we're to stay in it for the long term. That means discovering the priorities of our partners, their way of seeing the world, the knowledge, the information they bring to the, to, to the table, um, and finding a way to work together. And cut projects are in it for the long haul. We find that the more we work together over time, uh, the better the projects become, the better we are at understanding the needs of our partners, the better they get at understanding what a university can offer, its particular timetable, its particular way of working, its limitations um, and its benefits. So there are a number of core principles that we try to embed in our way of working. Um, and the first is not coming to the table without being open enough to understand the needs and priorities of our partners, uh, to create an equitable learning partnership to um, understand the information that our partners bring um, and to consider the needs particularly of traditionally excluded learners, their way of seeing the world, how they might best learn and best work with us. Um, and that also includes considering where we meet, the power implications of different spaces, how fe people feel about being, for example, in a university building, which for some people can be inhibiting um, and, and make it difficult for them to participate on an equal basis. The time taken to travel out to community lo locations, thinking of time for meetings that make it most easy for everybody to attend and to be properly present and properly able to work. Language is always a core issue in our work. The terms that are specific to specific cultures 
Um, whether they're all speaking the same home language uh, is one thing, but within the different spaces that we work, people have their own jargon, their own terminology. Um, even their own words, which are understood differently. The word research, for example, means very different things in different spaces. And often we can sit around a table talking about research with each partner having a very different view of what that means. For community partners, research often means a positive evaluation of their work. Whereas for university academics, it can be a critical analysis. Um, and we've learnt the hard way that those two things often come from very different spaces. And if we're going to work for, together effectively, we need to sort that out at an early stage. We see ourselves as brokers or boundary spanners who can broker between different cultures and different spaces. But I think being a broker yourself is not enough. You need to find a way to ensure that your partners, whether they're university academics or community people, are able to work effectively in both spaces too. So we have a mediating role to translate language, to ensure that people are comfortable, people are able to contribute. Um, and to think about things in the long term, even with short term resource, even if we don't know where resource is coming from to continue a partner, it's useful for us to take a much more longer term strategic approach and to try and ensure that our partnerships are able to last and able to work together in different iterations and in different ways. We frequently get inquiries from different parts of the world too, and we see Community university partnerships is not something that's specific to the UK alone. It's part of a much wider global movement um, and a number of global networks that try to develop this work in different countries of the world. But when we get requests from different parts of the world, we see our main priority, our, our main duty, is to support universities in those countries to be able to respond. So if we're approached by community organisations or people working on community programmes in different parts of the world, we try to encourage them to contact their local university and then we try to play a role in supporting that university to be able to work with them. Um, and to that end, we've developed over the past couple of years a course in developing community university partnerships that's run partially online and partially face to face. We had our first iteration of the course last year. Um, we're planning a new one starting in April 2016. It operates through a week's intensive program in Brighton to enable the different participants to get to know each other well and share their own knowledge uh, between the group. Um, and by the end of the week, people are in a a place where they can properly support each other and use their own resources and their own questions to support each other through the rest of the course. So after the initial weeks intensive, we have a monthly online seminars. Uh, we have an online platform where we share information and resources, where we share reading. Um, and each participant has an individual mentor to mentor them and support them in implementing an action research project in their own country. The next course, as I say, is starting in April 16, running through to September 16. We'd love to see you there. We'll leave you with some reading material. Um, please contact us again if you need more. Uh, a whole host of resources on our own website um, and a couple of articles that we've mentioned there. As well as a series of tools, some of which have been developed by CARP and others by other universities in the UK, uh, which are on the website of the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, a university-wide uh, network for um, UK partners, but with a number of tools that may be useful to other partners outside of the UK. And if you'd like to contact us, please do so through Twitter, through our own network, through our website, or by looking at Community21 and emailing us for advice and support.